So hopefully you're here tonight to learn more about pollinators. We're going to jump right in here. Um, when we're talking about pollination, what we're talking about is plant reproduction, right? How does the pollen or the male ingredient, right, get to the female part of the plant so that that plant can produce a seed and make more plants, right? And um, when we're talking about pollination, we're really referring to our gymnosperms and our angiosperms, right? Our ferns or our spore producing plants. Um, and their allies don't need to be pollinated, right? Their, per, their reproduction works a little bit differently. So we're really, we're talking about our gymnosperms, uh, those plants that produce cones, right? And then our angiosperms, those plants that produce flowers and fruit, okay? Gym, gymnosperms are, are more ancient plants. They developed uh, approximately 320 million years ago, and there's roughly about a thousand living species on the planet today. Um, our angiosperms uh, developed more recently, about 150 million years ago, and there's approximately 300,000 living species today. So there's something to be said for flowers, right, and fruits and their success because so many plants do it, right? It's got to be a pretty good strategy. So in terms of reproduction and pollination, there's um, more than one way that plants do it, right? Getting that pollen, the male ingredient, to the female part of the plant. Um, some plants do it via wind, and this is the case with most of our gymnosperms and our conifers, right? Roughly 12% of flowering plants are pollinated this way, including some of our large canopy trees, like our oaks, hickories, and walnuts, and sometimes maples. Um, it's much more common for plants to be pollinated via wind in the temperate parts of the world. So you think of like our climate and further north. And it's fairly uncommon in understory plants, right? Dogwoods and spice bushes and red buds aren't going to be wind pollinated. It's pretty tough for the wind to blow pollen long distances down at the bottom level of a forest. Um, some plants right move their pollen around via water and this is true uh, mostly for aquatic plants hydrilla and pond weed being good examples it's relatively rare palm trees are a great example of trees that use um where i'm sorry i'm thinking of seed dispersal when it comes to palm trees and water so it really is you know a relatively rare um, method of pollination right it's mostly our aquatic plants that do it this way and then finally, a lot of plants depend on animals, otherwise known as pollinators, to move their pollen from one plant to another, or from one flower to another. So 80% of flowering plants depend on pollinators to do the job. Um, it's much more common in tropical parts of the world, especially when we think about insect pollinators. And um, there must be something to it, right? If 80% of flowering plants do it this way, it's got to be pretty successful. OK, when we think about uh, wind pollination and the amount of pollen that a flower has to produce, right, to just sort of scatter randomly and cross its fingers and hope that that pollen makes its way via wind to another plant, that's a lot of pollen that has to be produced. Um, and so if a plant can be a little bit more specific um, and more targeted in its approach, right, it, will probably do that. And that's what we're seeing when plants depend on pollinators. That's a little bit more of a specific targeted strategy. On the right here, you're seeing plants that uh, reproduce, or I'm sorry, yeah, pollinate or reproduce via wind, right? We've got um, white pine down here. You can see that gust of pollen floating in the wind here. We've got red oak catkins, right? Uh, these catkins dangle and hang below, right? Those are clusters of pollen that hang below those tiny little leaves before the leaves fully emerge, right? To take advantage of those wind gusts when the leaves aren't in the way. And then at the top, you've got red maple flowers, which again are taking the same strategy, emerging before the leaves come out. Red maple flowers um, may sometimes be pollinated by animals, also sometimes pollinated by wind. There's some research out there that shows they do a little bit of both. OK. Um, well, we're talking again about pollination, particularly when it comes to flowers, right? We just want to focus on um, that male part of the plant, the stamen, and its pollen producing structures and understanding that that pollen has to get to the carpal or the, the female part of the flower and make its way down to the ovary where a seed will develop. And 
Flowers come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors to make sure that this happens. Um, some plants have male flowers on one tree and female flowers on another tree or plant. Uh, some plants have male and female flowers on the same plant, and some plants have flowers that have both male and female parts. So it really just depends on the plant. It depends on the flower. There's an incredible amount of diversity when it comes to flower structure um, and you know color, size, shape, texture. It's amazing. <laughs> We've got just a small sampling here, um, but really, right, that's one of the things that we enjoy about flowers, right, is just the incredible diversity that we have in the world. Okay, so when we're thinking about pollinators, right, those animals that move pollen for plants whether they're doing it intentionally or not. We've got our insects, right? our bees and our wasps, our butterflies and our moths, our beetles, our ants, and our flies. We also have birds, bats, and then finally people, which is what we're seeing here in the top right photo. This is an image from an article about fruit trees in China um, and the decline of some bee species and the expense of bringing in uh, colonies of bees to do the pollinating and it actually being cheaper to employ people to do that pollination than it is to bring in bees. So, um, you know, there's some research out there that shows maybe, you know, we'll see more of this in the future. Maybe we won't if we can do our job um, and make sure that, you know, we keep things good for our pollinators. We'll see. I'm happy to share that article with you if you're interested. Okay, so why are pollinators important, right? Why even talk about pollinators tonight? <laughs> why care what happens to our pollinators? Um, we can think of pollinators as what we call keystone species, right? So the survival of many other species depends on them. 80% of flowering plants, right, depend on an animal to move the male reproductive parts to the female reproductive parts to make seeds to make more plants. So without pollinators, those species wouldn't exist or continue to exist. 35% of food crops need pollinators. And that number, that percentage varies depending on the source, but it's fairly large, right? When you think of fruits and berries and vegetables and chocolate, vanilla, coffee, tea, honey, right? All of these food products um, depend on pollinators to survive and exist. And then plenty of plants that we depend on for things besides food need pollinators, right? Cotton, flax, alfalfa, canola, sunflowers, right? Some of those plants that we um, produce oils from or fabrics from. Trees, shrubs, and wildflowers that are animal pollinated provide habitat for a variety of other animals, right? When we think of our forests. And then animal pollinated plants provide other ecosystem services as well. So, right, trees are providing clean air and clean water, right? Trees and shrubs can provide erosion control. So there's all of these services that plants provide and many of those plants are pollinated by animals. So without the pollinators, the plants wouldn't exist. And right, we would be at a disadvantage, right? We need pollinators. I hope that's clear. And I imagine if you're here tonight for pollinators, you probably know a lot of this already. Okay. So a few interesting examples of pollinators from around the world and the relationships they have with their plants. Um, on the bottom right here, we have the black and white ruffed lemur, which is the world's largest animal pollinator. And it has an obligate relationship with this palm called the traveler's tree, where it's the only animal that has the ability to open and manipulate the flower to get the nectar, which is what the lemur is looking for. And in the process of licking up that delicious nectar, the lemur gets pollen all over its fur and then sticks its face in another flower and transfers that pollen from flower to flower. On the bottom left, we have an example of a pitcher plant and the two-spotted bumblebee. Um, again, this is an obligate relationship between the white-topped pitcher plant and the two-spotted bumblebee. A number of carnivorous plants like pitcher plants depend on animal pollinators, and it's interesting to think of this plant that usually eats insects as relying on an insect for reproduction. So how does it make sure that the insect can successfully move pollen around without getting eaten, right? And there's a couple ways that carnivorous plants do this. Um, sometimes the bloom, the flower, is in a different location than the trap on the plant itself. Other times the trap and the flower are not open at the same time. 
So uh, an insect can visit the flower without having to worry about getting trapped. Um, and then sometimes the trap and the flower admit different attractants. So um, the flower is going to smell a certain way and attract a certain kind of insect, and the trap is going to smell very differently and attract a different kind of insect. So um, it just depends on the plant. On the top left, we have um, the life cycle of the fig wasp, uh, which if you've ever eaten a fig <laughs> and you have found a wasp inside, that's super cool. Um, but figs are interesting plants in that the fruit actually contains the flowers on the inside. So this is a really complicated life cycle, but basically the female will enter a fig that smells right and attracts her via smell and she lays her eggs within the flowers that are within the fig and she pollinates some of the female flowers by spreading pollen from the fig where she was born. Um, the male wasps will emerge first right from those eggs and fertilize the females which are still growing and then the male flowers inside the fig will bloom by the time the females emerge. So as the females are exiting the fig in which they were born, they're carrying pollen from the male flowers that they then take to another fig where they'll be laying their eggs and get that pollen on the female flowers that are inside that fig. So it's just wild, um, really fascinating. There's um, obligate relationships between certain species of fig and certain species of wasp. And if you want to learn more, there's a lot more out there. Super complicated, but that's sort of the basics. Um, and then finally, on the top right, we have, um, I'm forgetting our bat here, a Mexican long-tongued bat and agave. So agave is pollinated by bats, right? It blooms at night when bats are out and about. And these bats with their long tongues stick their long tongues into the long flowers, get pollen all over their face, and then move along. I wasn't aware that agave produces flowers on these incredible stalks that almost look like trees. So as a bat right at night is sort of swooping around in the sky, it doesn't have to come all the way down to the ground to drink the nectar from agave. It can drink that nectar right way up where the flowers are. So really incredible relationship there. And again, different species of agave have different species of bat that has evolved right to pollinate them. So just a few kind of worldwide examples that I thought were really fun and really interesting. Now we're going to move on to pollinators of Arlington. So I've got some examples here, some local examples of our different groups of pollinators that we can find here in Arlington. But I did want to stop and just see if anybody has questions so far, make sure everything's been clear. Anything I can clarify, we're ready to continue. Okay, I'll take that silence as we're ready to keep going. Um, so our beetles are the first pollinators of flowers. Um, it's estimated that they first started pollinating flowering plants 150 million years ago when flowering plants were first evolving, right? So beetles and flowering plants have this relationship that goes back millions of years to the very beginning of flowering plants. And there are 30,000 species of beetles in North America, so there's a lot of them. Um, they're not always great pollinators, but there are a lot of them. <laughs> so they do a lot of pollinating, even though they aren't always the best at it. Um, most beetles eat a mix of leaves and flowers and nectar and pollen, and so we call them mess and soil pollinators, where, for example, the June bug, which we might know as a garden pest, is going to eat leaves and eat flower parts, and in the process of like tumbling from flower to flower, get covered in pollen and move that pollen around inadvertently. Um, other beetles pollinate a little bit more purposefully, right, where they are actively seeking out pollen. So our locust borer right down here and our goldenrod soldier beetle up here um, feed on pollen as adults. And so they are not doing damage to the plant or the flowers. They're actively seeking pollen from flowers. So as they're moving from flower to flower, they're moving that pollen around. And as a result, right, pollination is happening. Um, our goldenrod soldier beetle will also sometimes eat other insects and nectar as well. So it's not um, a pollen, right, an obligate pollen eater. It is going to eat other things, but it will eat pollen as well. 
Um, and then finally, I wanted to share the buttercup oil beetle down here just because it does have a really interesting life cycle that involves plants and involves pollination. Um, the larva of buttercup oil beetles will actually climb to the top of a plant and sit on a flower and wait for a bee to come by and visit that flower, right? We know bees are visiting flowers for pollen and nectar. So here's our little um, buttercup oil beetle waiting for a bee to come along. Um, if it hops onto a male bee, it's going to wait on that male bee until that male bee mates with a female bee. If it hops on a female bee, hooray, it's going to ride with that female bee until that female bee goes to lay her larva. And when she lays her larva, that or her eggs, that um, buttercup oil beetle larva is going to hop off the female bee and hop into wherever she has laid her egg. And it's going to feed on her eggs and the food that she's collecting for the egg, the pollen and the nectar that she might provision her egg with, and live that way. So they are parasites of bee eggs and bee larvae, but they're using flowers as a way to do it. So the adults of buttercup oil beetles um, may eat pollen and nectar, right? But really that unique life cycle where the larvae are kind of crawling up the flower and moving around the flower, they might be kind of moving pollen around along with the bees that they're hitching a ride along with. So kind of a fascinating, unique life cycle that involves flowers and pollen that I wanted to share. Um, if you're interested in planting things for beetle pollinators, you want to choose bowl-shaped flowers with white or green that are white or green that have exposed reproductive parts. So think our magnolias, our sassafras, our lotuses, um, tulip poplars down here in the bottom left, right? These flowers are kind of, uh, what's the right word? They take sort of an ancient shape where we think kind of our first flowers probably resembled magnolia flowers. And so our beetles really like them. Beetles also really like composite flowers or clusters of really small flowers like our goldenrods and our sunflowers, parsley and carrot relatives, which certainly we're seeing with our locust spore here and our goldenrod soldier beetle, right, really loving those clusters of tiny yellow flowers. Okay. All right. Um, next, we're going to talk about our flies, which maybe we haven't thought of as pollinators, but there are um, 16,000 species of fly in North America, very diverse group of organisms, and with beetles, they are some of the most ancient pollinators, and most are generalists, which means um, they're going to visit a variety of different types of flowers. So. And on the top here, we have our greater bee fly, right? Certainly looks like a bee, but it is a fly. It's a generalist, and as an adult, it eats nectar and pollen. So it is going to be intentionally visiting flowers for nectar and pollen. Um, the larvae are solitary bee parasites. So much like our buttercup oil beetle, um, the larvae of our greater bee fly are going to survive on the larvae and the food that are provided um, to ground nesting bees. And a, a female greater bee fly will actually kind of hang out on flowers and wait for female solitary ground nesting bees to come along and then follow them to where they're laying their eggs in the ground and flick their own eggs into that right nest space where the bee is laying her eggs so that they can survive. So again, wild relationships out there. Um, our yellow jacket hoverfly down here in the middle is a great example of what we call our flower flies. Um, so these are flies in the Cerfididae family. Excuse me for not always being able to pronounce my Latin as well as I wish I could. Um, but uh, Flies in this family are considered to be the second most important group of pollinators after bees. And that's because, again, they are intentionally visiting flowers for nectar and pollen. That's what the adults feed on. And they really like yellow and white flowers. So if you're doing some gardening at home for flies, right, plant your yellow and white flowers like daisies, asters, goldenrods, and flea beans, and you're sure to attract some flower flies. And finally, down at the bottom here, we have what we probably typically think of as a fly. This is our common green bottle fly. I'm sure we've all seen one in the house when we don't want it in the house. Um, the larva of these insects eat carrion, but the adults eat a mix of carrion, feces, pollen, and nectar. So um, 
adult females may actually seek out pollen as an additional source of protein when they're in the process of laying their eggs. So adults are actively seeking pollen and nectar from flowers um, and can be pollinators that way. Obviously, right, our um, flies that resemble bees and our bee mimics are probably better pollinators because they've got that buzz on their bodies to move pollen around. Um, our common green bottle fly, right, has a very hard exoskeleton. There is not too much buzz anywhere <laughs> for the pollen to collect. So they are not the most effective pollinators, um, but it's certainly they do make it happen. Um, for sort of those more traditional flies, we want to plant things um, that often can have a putrid or rotting smell um, or have an appearance similar to rotting flesh. So those are flowers like pawpaws, which you see in the center here, skunk cabbage on the left, um, trilliums typically have flowers like this, like we're seeing on the right, wild ginger, jack in the pulpit, although wild ginger I think is predominantly pollinated by ants. We'll get there. Okay, and then again for our flower flies, those yellow and uh, white flowers in the garden, if you're going to be planting for our fly pollinators. All right, next up are our butterflies. Um, butterflies are probably some of the prettiest pollinators, right? They're the ones that we often think of just because they are so conspicuous, but they really aren't always great pollinators. <laughs> That's because they're not looking for pollen. Um, they are nectar drinkers as adults, so they are never going to be eating pollen, right? Butterflies have a proboscis, which we're seeing down here on the bottom, that they use to slurp up nectar from flowers. So um, the adults drink nectar, the larvae eat plants, right? We've got 800 species of butterfly in North America. And if we're planting for butterflies, we want to plant um, flowers that have clusters of small blossoms that can serve sort of as a landing platform. Um, lots of bright colors typically tend to attract butterflies, red, yellow, and orange, and then the flowers that produce a lot of nectar. Again, right, our adult butterflies are nectar eaters. They're never looking for pollen. So if pollination is happening because their butterflies are visiting, it's a little bit of an accident, right? In that process of reaching for and getting nectar, maybe they get some pollen on their wings or their body and move that pollen around. Um, Plants that are great for butterflies include bee balms, joe pie weeds, milkweeds, asters, goldenrods, cone flowers, right? And we're seeing that in some of these images, right? We've got um, our silver spotted skipper here hanging out on milkweed, drinking nectar as an adult. Um, it is a generalist as an adult, so it will visit all kinds of flowers. The larva of silver spotted skippers uh, really need plants in the pea family that are going to eat the leaves of plants in the pea family or other legumes. So most butterflies and moths typically um, the young will focus on a family as a host plant and really only prefer to eat the leaves uh, from that host plant. I think monarchs are probably the most famous example where the larvae need various types of milkweed to survive, but the adults are nectar drinkers and are also generalists, right? They'll drink nectar from a variety of plants. Up on the right, we've got an Eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, as a larval, Right, caterpillars, our eastern tiger swallowtails prefer uh, plants in the magnolia family as well as the rose family, so any kind of apple or a plum. Um, eastern tiger swallowtails are a little famous for their role in pollinating the flame azalea, which is the native azalea in the Appalachian Mountains. For a long time, researchers didn't understand how the pollination was happening in flame azaleas because the male part of the flower is so far from the female part of the flower, right? A beetle or an ant, right, wouldn't easily be able to make that pollination happen. And what they've discovered is that the eastern tiger swallowtail is large enough that as it visits a flame azalea flower to drink the nectar and beats its wings, its wings actually will hit the male and the female parts of the flower and then move to another flower and again that pollen that's on its fuzzy wings um, is going to come off on that other flower. So they play a pretty important role in pollinating flame azaleas. Um, in the middle here we have a painted lady on cone flower. Painted ladies are also migratory butterflies the way monarchs are. Um, they as larvae love thistles, mallows, and nettles, but as adults, like so many of the butterflies we've discussed so far, right, are generalist. And then finally our gray hair streak down here 
Um, I think the gray hair streak is interesting because the larvae eat not only the leaves, but also the flowers and fruiting bodies when they're really little. And so it's possible those larvae do a little bit of pollinating when they're moving from flower to flower and munching the way beetles might munch, um, but, you know, probably not super effective. Um, I'm mentioning all of these host plants because if you are going to be planting in your garden for butterflies, you want to think about the plants that the juvenile or larva butterflies will need in addition to the plants that are going to attract your adults, right? We love seeing the beautiful adult butterflies. They bring color to our lives and to our gardens, but if we want to see the adults, we've got to make some space and some habitat for the larva as well. So if you're going to be planting for butterflies, remember those larval host plants too. Next up are our moths, right, our butterfly cousins. Uh, moths evolved first, butterflies came second, so there are more moths in the world than there are butterflies. There are about 10,000 species in North America, and like butterflies, the adults eat nectar and the larvae eat plants. Um, with moths, there are some adult species that don't eat at all, so we wouldn't necessarily consider to be pollinators because they're not visiting flowers for nectar um, and they're not moving that pollen around. Um, number of moths obviously are nocturnal, some are diurnal. I've included some of those diurnal examples here, like the Elanthus webworm, which is an introduced species, and the hummingbird clearwing moth. Um, which is a native species, right? Both of these are day feeding and day flying moths, and so you'll see them out collecting nectar during the daytime. On the bottom here, we have the Virginia creeper sphinx moth, which is a nocturnal feeding moth. Uh, Virginia creeper is the larval host for this moth, and it'll be out and about at nighttime. Again, drinking nectar. All three of these species are generalists. They're gonna drink nectar from any flower you've got in the garden. But when it comes to our night feeding butterflies, right, we wanna think about those flowers that bloom in the evening hours. So um, our primrose, for example, like we're seeing here, okay? And then finally, in the middle here, I've included our yucca moth or yucca moth, however you say that word, it depends, it's like tomato, tomato. Um, the yucca moth doesn't feed as an adult, so you might think, oh, there's no way it can be a pollinator, but it is a pollinator, and it's actually an obligate pollinator of our native yucca. Um, the male and the female yucca moths actually mate on yucca blossoms, and the female will collect pollen from the flower where she has mated, and then she'll move to a different plant, and she's going to lay her eggs in the ovary of the flower, and she's going to take that pollen that she collected in another flower and put it on the stigma of the flower where she's laid her eggs because her larva eat the seeds of the yucca flower. Okay, so in order for her larva to survive, that flower has to be pollinated to produce a seed. So she knows to move that pollen around, otherwise her babies aren't gonna survive. So even though she is not collecting pollen for herself, she's not even collecting pollen for her babies in the sense that her babies are gonna be eating it. Um, she is moving it around from one plant to another because her babies, her larvae, are gonna eat the seeds of that flower. So it's super important that that flower be successfully pollinated. There um, are different species of yucca moth that have obligate relationships with different species of yucca plants, right? And we consider this an example of co-evolution, which we um, have seen in some of our other examples as well, like our lemurs and our traveler's palms, right? Those um, pollinators and those plants evolved together right, to make that plant reproduction happen. And obviously there's some advantage to the pollinator as well, otherwise it wouldn't continue to be a relationship that was successful. Um, I included here um, native trees if you're gonna be planting for moths, um, because so many native trees are the host plants for moth larva. Okay, and again, we wanna think about, um, just like our butterflies, right, flowers with um, small clusters of tiny flowers that can serve as landing platforms, um, plants that have lots of nectar and are really fragrant and usually open in the evenings, at night, or kind of early, early in the morning. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep pulling here, going here. Moving on to our wasps. They are not the best pollinators um, because adult wasps 
typically um, are looking for insect protein for their young, right? But we'll talk about some exceptions here. So there are 4,000 species of wasps in North America, and they are not great movers of pollen. They drink nectar and sap as adults, and again, many of them are collecting insect protein, not pollen, for their young, but there are exceptions. Um, down here, we've got our pollen wasp, which is not found in Arlington, but is such an interesting example that I wanted to include it. They're typically found in the southwest in the desert, um, and they uh, collect and feed only pollen to their young. So um, they really prefer uh, plants in the penstemon family or the beard tongue family. There's some obligate relationships between certain species of pollen wasp and certain species of beard tongue that can be found out west. And they are an example of a wasp that does collect pollen specifically intentionally for its young and as a result moves that pollen around from flower to flower. Um, all of the other wasps that we're seeing here are drinking nectar as adults. Um, and so they're moving some pollen around when they're going from flower to flower to drink nectar. Um, our paper wasps in the middle here um, may eat nectar and may also store some nectar in the nest for their young. So they are an example of a wasp that may store some nectar, but again, um, it's not a huge component of the larval diet for a paper wasp. Um, potter wasps uh, are only going to be um, drinking nectar as adults, right? They provision their nests with live insect prey. So there's actually this species of potter wasps specifically um, provisions their young with live caterpillars. So they're going to be collecting caterpillars for their young and then sort of building right a nest around that caterpillar and laying the egg with the caterpillar in a chamber so that when the larva hatches from the egg, it's got something to eat right away. But again, um, only visiting flowers for nectar once they are adults. Um, the same is true for our cicada killer, which I'm so excited to see more of this spring and haven't yet, but you'd think we would be with all the cicadas that are out there. Um, they, uh, the females paralyze cicadas and drag the cicadas underground where they use the cicadas again to provision the nests for their young. They are only collecting nectar as adults, right, to feed themselves, not their babies. And the same is true um, for our bald faced hornet who will drink nectar and um, but for the most part are even kind of more carnivorous as adults, right? So they're drinking some nectar, they're maybe moving around a little bit of pollen, but they're not moving that pollen intentionally. They also don't have fuzzy bodies the way bees do. So they're not great pollinators. There just happen to be a lot of wasps. Um, and again, we've got our pollen wasps here that are kind of the exception to the rule. We just don't have them here in Arlington. <coughs> Excuse me, I almost forgot to tell you when we're thinking about planting for wasps, um, we want plants with clusters of small flowers and leaning platforms that are shallow, have easily accessible nectar. So this is really like our goldenrods and our asters, right? And we're seeing that in these pictures, right? Our hornet, our paper wasp, our potter wasps, they're all right on some type of goldenrod. Okay, so golden rods are going to bring your wasps in. So um, I will say, you know, if you're allergic to bees and wasps and you don't want wasps in your garden, I wouldn't tell you not to plant golden rod because so many other species also depend on it, like our butterflies especially are. Um, butterflies like our monarchs that are moving south in the fall and they need that burst of energy in the late fall when so many other plants aren't blooming. Um, but, you know, I would say it's okay to plant some golden rod. <laughs> okay. And then finally, our native bees, which are kind of the best of the best when we think about pollinators. Um, there are 4,000 species of bee in North America, and they are great pollinators because they move pollen intentionally, um, more so than any other animal we've learned about so far, right? Bees are the ones that are provisioning their nests for their young, right? This is the work of female bees, and they are moving pollen and moving nectar intentionally. That is the food they are feeding their babies. Um, Bees also do a couple things that make them really good pollinators for different reasons. And one is that they exhibit something called floral consistency, whether they are specialists or generalists. So a bee that's a specialist is always going to visit the same species of plant or same species of flower. A bee that's a generalist is going to visit all kinds of flowers. But even if it's a generalist, it's going to visit the same species of flower one after the other. 
right? So a bee that's a generalist might in one day, right, visit some goldenrod and some milkweed, although those things are never blooming at the same time, but bear with me, right? But it's going to visit goldenrod, 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 and then hop on over to, you know, aster, aster, aster. So when I say floral consistency, that's what I mean, right? They're visiting the same type of flower in succession. And then bees also do something called buzz pollinate, where they kind of vibrate their bodies to stir the pollen up and get as much pollen as they can kind of stuck all over their body. So they're great pollinators. They're responsible for pollinating 75% of fruits, veggies, and nuts in the U.S. And they do it better than European honeybees, right? They have shorter ranges, which means that they typically stay in the same area pollinating the same group of flowers, right? So, you know, you've got an apple orchard, right? Your native bees are going to stay in that apple orchard instead of visiting the pear orchard and, right, the peach orchard, right? They're only in the apple orchard. They're active at a greater range of light and temperatures, so they can begin the work earlier in the year and earlier in the day um, than our honeybees can, and they can manipulate flowers to enhance pollination in ways that European honeybees can't always. So they are better pollinators than our European honeybees are. Um, some cool examples, we've got our orchard mason bee. Um, there are, I think, about 300 species of orchard bees um, in this Osmia genus. Uh, this one in particular is called our uh, blue orchard mason bee, and they are really, really great at pollinating almonds. Um, they are 25% more effective than honeybees, European honeybees, at pollinating almonds, and they're super important in the fruit industry. So they're great pollinators of apples, plums, peaches, and pears. Um, they are solitary nesters, so the females uh, don't kind of collect or gather together the way honeybees or some wasps do, right? It's just one mama provisioning a nest with pollen and nectar for just her babies. Um, on the right here at the top is a rusty patched bumblebee, which is we call a eusocial bee. Um, not truly social the way honeybees are, um, but will sort of work with other female bees to make sure those young survive. Again, provisioning the young with pollen and nectar. Um, this bumblebee is um, one of our federally endangered species. So listed um, on the endangered species list in 2017, there's been an 85% decline in their historic range. And there's a number of reasons why we aren't seeing so many native bees. Um, we're not going to get into that in this presentation because there's a lot of different reasons. But if any folks have questions about that, I'm certainly happy to answer those questions and provide a little more research. Um, bumblebees in particular, uh, not necessarily specific to the rusty patch bumblebee, but bumblebees um, in general are usually about 40 to 60 percent more effective at pollinating tomatoes than our honeybees are. So we need our bumblebee. Um, in the bottom middle here is our squash bee, which has uh, an obligate relationship with uh, plants in the cucurbit family. So our squashes, our gourds, our pumpkins. Um, they might obtain nectar from a lot of different plants, but they only provision their nests, right, with pollen from plants in the cucurbit family. So they need squash, and squash needs them. Um, squash needs them to produce the squash, right? In my garden, I have yet to find a squash bee. The males will actually rest in the flowers and wait for the females. And if you have observed squash flowers in your garden, you know they open in the early morning and they typically close before noon. So sometimes if you you open up a squash blossom in the afternoon, you can find a male squash bee just kind of resting inside that flower, waiting for a female to come along so that they can mate and do their thing. Um, the rolled mallow bee has a similar strategy. So this bee um, really prefers uh, pollen for its young from flowers in the hibiscus family. And if you've got any rose mallow or rose of Sharon, you know that those flowers also close up at night. Uh, this picture is actually from my garden where one evening I was out and about and I opened up one of the flowers um, before the sun set and found this little guy hanging out inside. So just like the squash bees, the males are resting inside the flowers and hanging out and waiting for the females for that um, opportunity to mate with them. And again, the females are collecting pollen just from hibiscus flowers to provision the nests for their young. Okay, kind of amazing. 
And then finally, I included our Eastern Carpenter Bee here below. We've talked about a number of specialists, right? Bees that really prefer to visit one particular kind of flower. Our Eastern Carpenter Bee is a great example of a generalist bee. Um, the females are not totally solitary, but they're not totally social the way other bee species are. Um, they might kind of nest in or near or around other females, but they're not always necessarily working together. Um, they will eat pollen and drink nectar as adults, and then they're also, so there's a little bit of mixed research out there. I was doing some research before the presentation tonight as to whether or not they provision those chambers that they create in wood for their babies. From what I understand, they don't, right? They're going to lay their eggs um, inside those chambers or tunnels that they hollow out in wood. And then as the larva hatch, they will actually feed the larva nectar and pollen. Um, but from what I understand, not necessarily provisioning the chambers where the eggs are laid with that pollen prematurely. More research to be done on that, but that was kind of what I discovered um, this afternoon when I was trying to get to the bottom of it. You're going to be planting for bees. You want to plant things with bright colors, particularly um, blue. Bumblebees really love blue and purple. Um, lots of sweet smelling nectar, landing platforms, right? Or flowers that have bilaterally symmetrical parts, right? When we think of like our, our beard tongue, right? Where there's not radial symmetry, but there's bilateral symmetry, and a bee can kind of climb in to that flower and kind of move the petals where they need to be moved. Um, asters, bee balms, milkweeds, bluebells, blueberries, beard tongues, red buds, basswood, um, all these flowers right, are preferred by bees and loved by bees. Oops, give me one second to get to our next page here. And then finally, I wanted to talk about um, our only bird pollinator um, in our area, and that's the ruby-throated hummingbird, right? Our ruby-throated hummingbird is a nectar drinker. These tiny birds depend on nectar to survive. It's incredible. They have amazingly fast metabolisms. I forget how often they have to eat in order to stay alive, but it's nuts. Uh, and they really prefer flowers that are tubular, where they can put that long beak of theirs into the flower and lap up the nectar that's at the bottom of the flower. And they prefer flowers that are red or orange, which is why so many of our hummingbird feeders come in red and orange colors. If you're going to feed hummingbirds, um, you know, a sugar solution instead of planting flowers, that's fine. Uh, it doesn't have to be the commercially dyed red stuff, right? Sugar water works just fine. I can give you the, the ratio if you'd like the sugar water ratio. Um, it's just the feeder that needs to be red to attract them because really they're looking for nectar from those red flowers, right? Our columbine, our coral honeysuckle, trumpet creeper, cardinal flower, um, bee balms, I think I said it all, right? All of these red tubular shaped flowers are going to attract our hummingbirds that need that nectar to survive. And again, when they put their face into the flower to drink the nectar, they get pollen on those feathers on their face. And when they go to the next flower, right, that pollen comes off and gets transferred from one flower to another, right? Helping pollination happen. Finally, I briefly wanted to talk about ants as pollinators. Um, ants are commonly pollinators of plants that are low growing, that have small flowers that are close to the stem, right? Ants aren't great at climbing tall distances. Um, you know, there are other uh, pollinators that do a better job with other flowers. So those little flowers close to the ground, I think like partridge berry and stone crops and spurge, Allegheny spurge. Um, these are the kinds of plants that are going to be pollinated by ants. However, in my garden, I've yet to find a squash bee, despite opening many squash blossoms, <laughs> but I have found a lot of ants. So it may be the case, you know, in our gardens where we've got uh, plants that have flowers close to the ground, the way squash and pumpkins sometimes do. Um, ants are doing that pollination for us. Uh, more research to be done by me primarily. I'm sure the research is out there. I just haven't done it all. Um, ants as pollinators are much more common in tropical areas. So um, there are plants in tropical areas that depend on ants as obligate pollinators. And a lot of times those ants right, emit a toxin that 
defends the plant against uh, nectar robbers, right? So those animals that might come and drink the nectar without doing any pollinating, right? Or um, just herbivores, right? Plants are gonna, or animals that are gonna munch on the leaves of plants, right? And, and do some damage to the plant, right? The ants can sort of serve as a, a primary means of defense while also pollinating the flowers. So it's kind of a good relationship, right? The ants get something to eat, okay? And the, the plants get a little bit of defense and someone to move their pollen around. So again, much more common in tropical areas than what you see here in our part of the world. When we think about what to do to help pollinators, right? We talked a little bit about how important pollinators are, why we need them, right? Why they're an important part of our, um, of our world. Here are some things that we can do to support them. So the first is eliminating pesticide and insecticide use. So many of our pollinators are insects. Um, we need them, right? So if you are able to eliminate pesticide use in your yard, if you have a home with property, um, or you're able to at least reduce your usage or time it kind of more effectively, that's the first step, first great step you can take. Um, providing food for pollinators, so all of the different plant suggestions that I've shared this evening, want to be sure to plant native plants that include a variety of heights and colors and bloom times, so you've got something blooming from March all the way through October. It, there's always something um, for a pollinator, there's always a flower for a pollinator to visit. Like we talked about, particularly for our butterflies and moths, we want to be sure to include larval food plants. So don't forget the young need something to eat too, even if it might not be a big showy beautiful flower. And we want to plant in clumps to attract pollinators. Um, it's tempting to want to plant, I know in my garden, I'm like one of everything, right? <laughs> I'm a little bit of a collector that way. But for a butterfly, um, or even a hummingbird, right, that's looking for a cardinal flower, let's say, it's going to be a lot easier to find those cardinal flowers if there's a big chunk of cardinal flower in your garden, right, as opposed to just one solitary cardinal flower plant that's surrounded by a bunch of milkweed. So planting in large clumps to attract pollinators just makes it easier for them to find what they're looking for. Providing shelter for pollinators, so leaving some areas wild, especially through the winter. And by wild, I mean not cutting back stems, um, before, you know, the temperature warms up to about 60 degrees the following spring, right, there are probably plenty of bees that have nested inside those hollow stems. So you want to um, leave those areas wild so that the larvae have a chance to overwinter in a place to overwinter. They can next spring, right, become adults and do all of their good pollinating jobs. Leaving areas of exposed bare ground, right? This is really important for our um, bee pollinators that are ground nesters, right? They need places where they can get into the dirt. Adding fallen branches or logs, again, important for our um, pollinators that might nest and lay their larvae inside branches and logs. Um, and then creating insect houses and structures, which if you're interested in that, I'm happy to provide some guidance on what makes a good bee house. Um, we've got some here at the Nature Center that, you know, if you visit, I'd be happy to share with you and just talk a little bit about what, what makes, again, what makes a good bee house. Um, reducing artificial light at night, super important for our moths um, who are attracted to that light and might get eaten <laughs> in the process, right? Our predators, like our tree frogs and our bats, know to visit those artificial lights um, to eat moths. So if we want to do moths the solid, we can make sure that our artificial lights are off at nighttime. And then finally, Virginia has this cool program where um, you can, when you go to get a new license plate, um, provide a donation that supports a pollinator habitat. So it's called the Pollinator Habitat Program Plate. Um, similar to like the Save the Bay Plate, just uh, particular to pollinators and pollinator habitat. I've included some additional resources here. So if uh, you want to learn more, I'll be sending this out probably tomorrow sometime. And there's lots of great information here on pollinators and creating pollinator friendly yards and habitats. Um, a lot to learn uh, here on the links that I've shared. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing.